In July 2014, I was doing a solo backpacking trip around the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State, with various stops in Olympic National Park. A few days in, I happened to stop in Quinault and ended up on a random road that dead-ended at a stunning spot by the Quinault River. The view was incredible, with an old footbridge crossing the river, looking like something out of a fantasy movie. Being July, it was extremely hot, and there I was all alone, with the cool, clean water right in front of me. I hadn't properly washed in about four or five days, so I wasn't feeling very fresh. You can probably guess what happened next. I drove my car to the edge of the road, turned it around in case I needed to leave quickly, and then hiked down an embankment to the river's edge with a towel in hand. I didn't have any swimwear with me, but I thought a quick dip in my underwear would get me clean without feeling too exposed. Despite how deep in the woods I was, where it seemed like I was completely alone, the emphasis is on seemed. Because as it turned out, I wasn't. You know how people talk about feeling like they're being watched? Sounds cliche, right? Like it depends on how paranoid the person is. Well, I'm not paranoid at all, and I'd even say I'm somewhat of an exhibitionist. I have friends who would rather pay for a hotel just to use the bathroom, which is why I was backpacking alone. It wasn't that I felt like I was being watched, but more that it started to dawn on me that what I was doing was a bad idea. I couldn't figure out why at first. It's not like sharks swim up into the Quinault River, but I just felt too exposed, too vulnerable. I tried to tell myself I was being irrational, but I couldn't shake the feeling. So, after just a few minutes of washing, I climbed out of the river and walked over to where I had stashed my clothes and towel. As I was walking up the embankment, with my back to the other side of the river, I felt a sense of relief, like I was at a home base. But just as that feeling of exposure started to fade, I happened to glance across the river and saw something. At first, I thought it was a bear, but it quickly became clear that a bear was the least of my worries. Standing on the opposite bank, a bit higher up than me, was a man. He was dressed in what looked like hand-stitched clothing made from animal hides. His hair was like dreadlocks, but some strands seemed to be woven around twigs. He looked like a mountain man, straight out of a wilderness survival story. We stared at each other in shock for a moment, surprised to have come across one another. Then, without saying a word, the man made a beeline for the old bridge. Seeing this made my stomach turn. I was praying that the worst would be him yelling at me to put some clothes on, but the fact that he was trying to get closer without saying anything made it clear that he had bad intentions. I panicked, grabbed my car keys, and tried to get my clothes and shoes, but they got caught in some blackberry vines. I made a split-second decision to leave my clothes behind and get out of there with my life. When I broke free from the blackberry bush, I could see him rapidly crossing the bridge toward me. I raced to my car, flung the door open just as he arrived, locked the doors, and he started pounding on the hood, screaming and grunting incoherently. As soon as he moved toward the driver's side, I hit the gas and sped off as fast as I could. I glanced back and saw him chasing after me. He must have run after my car for at least a mile until he finally disappeared from view. I was bleeding all over from running almost unclothed through the blackberry bushes. I was wet, nearly unclothed, shaking and crying. If I had hesitated for just a few seconds longer, I don't think I would have made it out alive. Even typing this story out now, all these years later, I'm starting to shake. I felt like I was being hunted. That's the only way I can describe it. I'll never go back to that area again. Since then, I always bring a hiking buddy with me when I venture out into the wilderness. That day will haunt me for the rest of my life. Even after many years of therapy, that experience is still as vivid as the day it happened. I'm a water scientist, which basically means I spent most of my 20s studying water and somehow didn't lose my mind from the monotony. But all jokes aside, it's actually a lot more fascinating than you might think. 
and if you get a decent degree from a good university, your career options are quite broad. We work with farmers to ensure crops grow well, collaborate with water treatment plants to keep your drinking water safe, and make sure it flows cleanly and plentifully into your home. We also do things like survey parts of rivers that could potentially be dammed. With proper assessment, a dam can provide a significant amount of green energy without causing too much harm to the environment. It was one of these survey jobs that took me to the wilderness of Washington in the summer of 2017. Given the season, it seemed like a pretty sweet gig on the surface. It was a well-paid, high-stakes job that could make or break someone's multi-million dollar government contract. But between you and me, it was basically a paid hiking trip. I would hike around, assess the bedrock, jot down some notes, and I figured the whole job would take no more than five or six days. That way, I could enjoy the pay as well as the sunshine. But I didn't even last three days. By the evening of the third day, I was racing out of the woods as fast as I could, carrying only my car keys, phone, and a survival knife. There's something very wrong happening in the woods of Colville National Forest, and I think it's seriously bad. On the first day, I arrived in a little place called Onion Creek, a quiet town with a general store where I grabbed a few last-minute supplies. When I asked the store clerk for a good, quiet spot to park my car, he was kind enough to offer me a free parking space behind the store, promising to keep an eye on it while I hiked up into the pine-covered hills. The pines I was prepared for, but the hills were another story. I like to think I'm fairly fit, but those hills really took it out of me. Even walking in a zigzag pattern to reduce the steepness, lugging my gear up the side of that first hill was pure agony. I slept like a log that first night, barely having the energy to complete my work. The next morning was more of the same, burning leg muscles and a back soaked with sweat. But I stayed positive, telling myself I was getting one heck of a workout, even though I don't think I'd ever been that exhausted before. The worst part was how bad I smelled, and the idea of hiking down to the river to get clean only to be drenched in sweat again by the time I got back to camp felt like a nightmare. I made do with baby wipes that second night, promising myself a real wash on the third day when I'd also refill my water supply. On the morning of the third day, I woke up with a terrible headache. I took some painkillers, put on my boots, and went into the woods to take care of business only to find that my urine looked like whiskey. It was that dark. I was seriously dehydrated, having rationed my water supply a bit too strictly. I decided then and there to hike down to the river, drink as much fresh water as I could, and finally clean myself up. When I arrived at the river, I drank a lot of water, then stripped down to my underwear and waded into the shallows to rinse off, knowing I could change into fresh boxers back at camp. But as I was getting out of the water, I could swear I saw something moving on the bank near where I'd left my clothes. Unless it was a very isolated gust of wind, something was definitely shifting among the trees. I was a little spooked, but having some deer watch me bathe wasn't exactly a big deal. So I just grabbed my stuff, dried off a bit, and started hiking back up to camp. Later that day, while I was hiking, I began to notice a horrible smell. At first, I thought it was me. Maybe my clothes stank or I'd somehow been sprayed by a skunk, but the further I walked, the stronger the smell got until I was practically gagging from how bad it was. Then, just as I was about to vomit, I looked up, trying to catch a breath of fresher air, and that's when I saw it. It was either a fox or a coyote, but it was in such a bad state that I couldn't tell which. It honestly looked like someone had caught it, beaten it to death, and then hung it up in a tree. The only reason I could think for someone to do that would be to scare off other animals from their land. Brutal but effective, I guess. But there wasn't a farm for miles around. And soon, I realized that the dead animal wasn't the only one strung up in the trees. I kept walking, trying to escape the smell, but no matter which way I went, I couldn't seem to get away from the stench of death. It was hot, so you can imagine how bad it was. But it wasn't just the heat making it unbearable. 
There were dead animals hanging in nearly every other tree, all in various states of decay. I saw dead raccoons, rabbits, moles, and rotten weasels. Heck, I even think I saw half a deer skeleton up there at one point, at least I hope it was just a deer. After that, as I mentioned earlier, I basically just ran. I didn't bother packing up my tent or anything. I just bolted back to my car in Onion Creek and got the hell out of there. I don't want to think about how much money I lost by abandoning that job. I'd type it out if I didn't think it would make me sick all over my keyboard. But honestly, I can't think of any amount of money that would make me go back out there and risk ending up like one of those poor creatures hanging in the trees. During my college days, I worked at a summer camp for Boy Scouts. This happened during the summer after I graduated, making it my last time at the camp. Every week, I would take a large group of campers to a somewhat remote spot in the woods, though it wasn't as isolated as it seemed, where we would work on the Wilderness Survival Badge. The activities included building a shelter out of branches and leaves, sleeping in it overnight, making a campfire, and cooking food over it basic survival skills. Like I said, we weren't exactly deep in the wilderness, more like half a mile from the main camp, but we'd lead the kids in circles to make the spot feel more remote. One night, after all the campers had finished building their shelters, we cooked dinner and gathered around the campfire, singing songs and sharing scary stories. It was getting late, around 10 p.m., so I sent the campers to their shelters for the night and began to extinguish the campfire as part of our usual safety procedures. That's when we all heard what sounded like a church bell ringing faintly in the distance. It wasn't very loud, but both the kids and I could clearly hear it. The bell rang every few seconds for a couple of minutes. Since we had been telling spooky stories, the kids got a bit scared, thinking it was something supernatural. I tried to reassure them, saying it was just a late night church service in the nearest town. But in truth, the only thing keeping me from being scared too was my responsibility to the kids. You see, as far as I knew, there wasn't a town or a church within 20 miles of our location. This was confirmed later when I checked a map of the area. When I asked an older counselor if there were any rural churches nearby, he said no. But when I pressed him further about why we might hear church bells in the woods late at night, he gave me a rather unsettling look before saying he had heard it too, but it was nothing to worry about. I wasn't particularly worried until he said that. Sure, I had been a little spooked, but mostly I was confused. I thought our camp was deep in the woods, far from any town, so finding out I was wrong about that was disorienting. I might have been more curious if the head counselor, whom I'll call Bill, hadn't said he heard the bells as well. That made it seem more normal, until Bill abruptly canceled the remaining wilderness camps the next day. All the other junior counselors were disappointed since the wilderness camp was one of the most enjoyable activities. They shrugged it off and moved on, but that's when I started getting really uneasy. If there was nothing to worry about, as Bill had said, why did he cancel the remaining trips? When I asked him about it, politely, not confrontationally, he told me there had been several bear sightings in the last 24 hours, and he didn't want to take any risks. It seemed like a solid reason, especially since we were up in northern Colorado, where there were plenty of grizzly and black bears, particularly after a wet spring like we had that year. But the fact that Bill never connected the bear sightings to the church bells, and didn't explain why the bells made him uneasy, left me with a bad feeling. We never had any incidents with missing kids or strange people in the woods during my time there. And to my knowledge, no one saw any bears either, nor were there any signs of them. No scratches on trees, no bear droppings, nothing. So, I found it hard to believe that bears were Bill's only concern. Yet that's where the story ends. I was too busy with my duties to play detective, and I liked Bill, having worked with him for years, so I didn't want to jeopardize our relationship by accusing him of lying. As much as I would have liked to explore the woods like a detective, 
Being alone in the forests of Cache County in the spring would have been a foolish thing to do. So that was that. I never returned to work at the camp, and no one was ever harmed, at least not by mysterious bell sounds from the woods. No further explanation ever came about the strange bell ringing, but it's become my go-to creepy story over the years. It's a story that remains unsettling because whatever caused that sound, and why Bill became so nervous afterward, is still a mystery to me, even after all these years. During my time in college studying biology, we had a guest speaker come in to give a lecture one semester. We all recognized her name instantly as she was well known in the world of orangutan conservation. After her talk, we learned that she was looking for two students to join a year-long research project after graduation, which would take place in Borneo. I had always wanted to travel but never knew how I would afford it. So this opportunity, funded by the Research Foundation, felt like a miracle. Growing up in suburban Indiana, the idea of going to Borneo, located in Southeast Asia just south of the Philippines, seemed incredibly exotic. The trip was a dream come true, but I have to emphasize that it was extremely tough work. We had to wake up at around 3.30 a.m., work six days on with three days off, and spend about 14 to 15 hours each day in the hot and humid rainforest. Our task was to track wild orangutans and take data every two minutes. These orangutans were completely wild, so we made a point to keep our distance and never tried to touch them. Our goal was to observe them while not disturbing their natural behavior. However, during my year there, I had three terrifying encounters with a big dominant male orangutan in the area. Although he never actually touched me, he certainly scared me and made me run. The work was exhausting, both physically and mentally, and the relentless mosquitoes made it nearly unbearable. Additionally, we had no communication with the outside world except on our days off when we had to walk almost an hour to a tree stand in the jungle. The signal was so weak that we couldn't make any actual calls, but we could sometimes get one bar of service to send a few WhatsApp messages to family and friends. We typed them out, and when that bar appeared, the messages would slowly send. Then, it was back to airplane mode to save battery, and someone else would take their turn. One morning, when I was on shift, we got up, did our morning routines, and headed into the jungle at first light. I was incredibly tired, struggling to keep my eyes open, but in an instant, I went from half asleep to fully awake. Just a few meters off the trail ahead of us, crouched among the foliage, was a clouded leopard. It stayed completely still, just staring at us with its big amber eyes, while the other American researcher and I froze. Encounters like this are extremely rare, not only because clouded leopards are endangered, but also because they usually stay far away from any human settlements. I figured it would run off in the opposite direction once it saw us, and I remember thinking, enjoy this while it lasts. But when the leopard stood up and took a few creeping steps towards us, the fear kicked in. Thankfully, one of the indigenous people we worked with took out his slingshot and fired rocks at it. It only took one rock landing near the leopard for it to disappear back into the jungle. It took us a good five minutes to calm down and our guide explained that it was likely a young leopard curious about us. It might have been watching us during the night and then we just happened to bump into it on the trail, startling it so much that it went into fight or flight mode. If it weren't for our guide, we could have been in serious danger, and I think one of us might owe him our life. Once we felt ready, we continued down the trail. As I mentioned earlier, it was still very early in the morning, and the canopy was so thick that even though there was enough light to see, there were still many dark patches among the foliage. As you can imagine, I wasn't comfortable with that at all, so I took out my flashlight and started shining it into the darker areas of the jungle. The first couple of times, I saw nothing, but on the third attempt, boom, a pair of glowing eyes stared back at me. My flashlight wasn't strong enough to fully illuminate the leopard, but it was unmistakably there, 
watching us from the darkness. This is where I get to explain why we worked such long hours for extended periods. Jungle research can be incredibly dangerous, and predators like big cats can be the least of your worries sometimes. Needless to say, we couldn't just continue on with a leopard stalking us. They're ambush predators, so theoretically, if we kept our eyes on it, we wouldn't have a problem. But just try keeping your eye on something that's evolved over millions of years to avoid being seen. One little mistake, one slip up, and one of us could have lost our life, and no zoological breakthrough is worth that. So yeah, being stalked by a clouded leopard was definitely the scariest thing that happened during my Borneo trip. My name is Tom, and I'm part of a UK-based hiking charity called The Walkers Club. We focus on enjoying the simple pleasures of walking and hiking, as well as preserving the natural spaces that many people cherish. I get it, it might sound dull, and honestly, most of the members are either retirees in raincoats or people who think they're Bear grills. But the Sunday morning strolls aren't why I joined The Walkers Club. When you dig into the history of the group, you realize they were once quite intense. To keep it brief, the whole hiking movement began in the late 1800s. At that time, wealthy landowners wanted to buy up large parts of the countryside and make it private. Naturally, this angered many people, leading to protests that involved mass trespassing on private land. There were confrontations, arrests, and even injuries. It was a big deal, and these events eventually led to the passage of a law allowing public right-of-way. So. When you go hiking, you're not just enjoying a pleasant weekend walk, you're exercising rights that were hard fought and won, preserving your freedom to access beautiful natural places. To me, that's something really special. I know I might be trying to sell you on the walkers club here, but that's usually what I tell people to spark some rebellious interest in our group. We're all about spreading the word after all, but trust me, there are plenty of things I don't tell people about hiking. If I did, it might discourage them from exploring the outdoors for good. Because when you regularly wander through forests, woodlands, and hilly terrains, you're bound to have some experiences that are hard to explain, and some that are downright frightening. Since I've probably bored you enough with the history of the group, I suppose it's only fair that I share a spooky story with you. This is something I came across while hiking near a small town in Wales. I was trekking through some dense woods in an area known as the Dean Forest. I stumbled upon what looked like an ordinary clearing. I had no plans to walk into it, it was drizzling, and the trees were providing some nice cover. But it caught my attention when I noticed what looked like a ball of grass hanging in midair. It reminded me of one of those strange phenomena you see in films, and I found myself stopping and staring at it as it gently swayed in the breeze. On closer inspection, I realized it wasn't really floating. It was hanging from a tree branch way above. Someone had fashioned a ball out of grass. Being naturally curious, I walked over to investigate. As I got nearer, I realized it wasn't just a bunch of bundled grass. It was solid turf. Imagine someone had cut out a chunk of your lawn and tied it into a ball. I couldn't find any seams on it, and for a moment, I was completely mesmerized by it. The rope used to hang it seemed handmade, entirely from natural materials, and whoever made it must have been quite skilled to create something strong enough to hold the weight of the turf ball. Not only that, but the rope was tied to a branch of an ancient oak tree, which was at least 20 feet high. It was an impressive piece of work, and the person who made and hung it was clearly dedicated. I gave the turf ball a gentle push, watching it sway as the rain pattered and the big old branch creaked above me. That's when I noticed something beneath the hanging turf ball that almost took my breath away. Directly below it was what looked like an old tree stump, but it had been worn down to almost ground level. The wood had been completely hollowed out, leaving only a thin ring of bark surrounding a complex pattern made from twigs, reeds, and interwoven wildflowers. The pattern looked like a series of expanding circles, almost like a blooming flower, and there had to be hundreds of small twigs in there, 
some bent into curves to create an almost three-dimensional effect. It must have taken days to assemble. I didn't see any patches of missing grass nearby, so whoever made the turf ball probably brought it from somewhere else. They might have even brought a ladder to reach the high branch or been a really skilled climber because scaling a 25-foot oak is no easy task. I thought it might be some kind of underground art project or perhaps the quirky hobby of an eccentric gardener. But when I knelt down to examine the intricate design more closely, I noticed that not all the pieces were twigs. I picked up one piece, thinking it looked a lot like an old bone, only to realize that's exactly what it was. Given its small size, I assumed it was an animal bone, but then a chilling thought crossed my mind. It could just as easily have been a human finger or toe bone. Thoroughly spooked, I dropped the bone as soon as the thought hit me. But strangely, I couldn't bring myself to leave it out of place, so I carefully placed it back exactly where I found it, driven by some weird sense of fear. My next thought was that I needed to show this to someone. But just as I stood up to reach for my phone, I swear I heard movement in the trees behind me. I was startled. And as I turned, I hoped it was the person who had created the bizarre natural sculpture. But there was no one there. There's plenty of wildlife in that area. Deer, badgers, even weasels. So just because I heard a noise didn't mean it was a person. But I didn't hear any more rustling, and the silence that followed was unsettling. That's when I got the dreadful feeling that someone was watching me. Out of nervousness, I called out a greeting hoping the creator was just shy. But again, there was nothing, just complete silence. Yet I hadn't imagined the noise behind me. There was definitely something or someone there. I ended up putting my phone away, too scared to take any pictures. I had this deep, primal fear that if I turned my back, whoever was out there might take the chance to approach with sinister intentions. I mean, if they were willing to kill or at least use bones for their strange art project, who knows what else they'd be willing to do to protect it. Maybe it was just my nerves playing tricks on me, combined with the growing strangeness of what I was seeing. But I found myself backing away from the clearing, then practically power walking away with my head on a swivel until I felt I was at a safe distance. Safe from what, though? And as I started to ponder that, the fog of surrealness began to lift, and I was left wondering what on earth I had just seen. I wanted to go back, I really did, but the overwhelming urge to stay away was stronger than my curiosity. I tried convincing myself it was nothing more than the work of some bored hippies, and that I just spooked myself by picking up an old animal bone. That was the logical explanation, after all. So why couldn't I calm down enough to walk back? I'm not a believer in the supernatural, and I like to think I can handle myself in a tough situation. And I know I'm biased, but I'd never describe myself as a coward. But in that moment, every instinct was screaming at me to get out of there and never return. I did end up going back, though. This isn't some silly horror movie with plot holes you could drive a truck through. It's a true story. Granted, I waited weeks before I finally mustered the courage to return. That gave whoever made the thing plenty of time to remove it. The effort that had gone into creating such a strange and visually striking piece was almost a shame to see gone. I say almost because its absence somehow made the place even more ominous. Maybe someone else had stumbled across it, or perhaps some bored kids had decided to destroy it. But what if my discovery was what prompted its removal? What if it was destroyed to hide something sinister? In that case, what were they hiding and why? I kicked over what was left of the tree stump pattern, hoping to find one of the little bones I'd seen before, but there was nothing. Then, just like last time, but without the feeling of being watched, I backed away from the clearing and continued my hike. The whole turf ball and tree stump combination is undoubtedly the strangest and creepiest thing I've ever encountered while hiking. Probably the creepiest thing I've seen in my entire life, actually. Sure, on the surface it looked kind of cool, but the more I think about it, the bones, the mysterious person who stayed hidden, the potential meaning behind it all, the more relieved I am that it's gone.
On Sunday, May 19, 1996, 27-year-old Lila Wyman and 25-year-old Julia Williamson set off on a hiking adventure in Shenandoah National Park. Accompanied by their cherished golden retriever, Max Julia was originally from St. Paul, Minnesota, while Lila hailed from Unity, Maine. Both shared a deep love for nature and outdoor activities. The two had met nearly two years earlier at a now-defunct nonprofit in Minnesota called Wild Women, which focused on teaching wilderness survival skills and funding adventure trips for women. Friends described Lila Wyman as someone who enjoyed craft beer, fishing, and the occasional cigarette. She came from a well-off family in Michigan and had left home after finishing high school to enroll at Unity College near Waterville, Maine, where she trained to become a wilderness guide. Lila was passionate about helping others discover the joys of the wilderness, just as she had. Julia Williamson, on the other hand, was a talented geologist. She had been a successful high school athlete winning the Minnesota State Doubles Tennis Championship before heading to Spain to study dinosaur extinction. After graduating with top honors, Julia took a job at a bookstore in Lake Champlain, Vermont. The Shenandoah trip was meant to be a celebration of her new job, which was set to begin on June 1, 1996. However, when Julia failed to show up for her first day, concern began to grow. On May 31, 1996, after not hearing from his daughter for over a week, Thomas Williamson reported Lila and Julia missing. A search and rescue operation ensued, leading to the discovery of their car just north of Skyland Lodge. Bridget Bannett, the deputy chief ranger at Shenandoah National Park, later stated that initial searches focused on the trail corridors in the general area. During these searches, the team found Max, the golden retriever, wandering alone through the park without a leash. The next evening, on June 1, 1996, park rangers tragically discovered the bodies of Julia and Lila at their campsite near a horse trail known as Bridal Path. They had been bound, gagged, and their throats had been slashed. When investigators recovered Julia and Lila's camera, they were able to piece together the last few days of their lives. The couple had ventured into the woods along the White Oak Canyon Trail and later hitched a ride with a park ranger when the weather took a turn. Once the weather improved, they climbed Hawksbill, the highest peak in Shenandoah, before setting up camp by a picturesque Appalachian stream. Detectives believe that only a few hours after the last photo was taken, the couple's lives were violently ended. Adding to the horror was the fact that their campsite was just a quarter mile from Skyline Drive and a half mile from Skyline Lodge, both popular spots filled with tourists, hikers, and nature lovers. Given that it was Memorial Day weekend, the lodge would have been bustling with activity. Surely someone must have seen something. It was just a matter of finding the right person. It seemed unbelievable that two bodies could remain undiscovered in such a heavily trafficked area, especially on a busy holiday weekend. However, backcountry camping regulations at the time required campers to stay away from designated trails, fire roads, and developed areas. This isolation worked to the advantage of the couple's killer. Unfortunately, Julia and Lila were not the only couple to vanish in our nation's national parks. Many people lose their lives out there for various reasons. Accidental falls, wrong turns, or encounters with wild animals. Statistically, the likelihood of dying in a national park is relatively low, but murders and disappearances in these settings carry a particularly chilling sense of horror. This was something Sally Hurlbert, Shenandoah's management specialist, readily acknowledged. We don't see much crime in the park, she said. But when we found those poor women, it was terrifying. The thought that someone capable of such violence was among us was deeply unsettling. Special FBI units were assigned to work alongside the National Park Service to handle the investigation. The Virginia State Police's Special Crime Scene Unit also joined the effort, bringing in specialized equipment. However, interagency rivalries were the least of the team's problems. Investigating crimes in national parks is particularly challenging due to several factors. 
One FBI agent explained that the sheer number of people entering and exiting the park each day makes it easy for a perpetrator to slip away unnoticed. In 1996, the year Lila and Julia were murdered, 1.57 million people visited the park. Such a transient environment makes it difficult to track down a suspect. Another agent added that any crime scene in an outdoor environment is significantly larger than one in a residence. You have the initial crime scene and then the outer crime scene because you don't know where the person came from or where they went, he said. This makes the crime scene harder to contain and process. For more than a year, the National Park Service and the FBI pursued leads, following up on an estimated 15,000 tips. Unfortunately, none led to any significant breakthroughs and the case seemed destined to go cold. Then, in July 1997, Shenandoah was rocked by another violent incident. Shenandoah's Skyline Drive is popular with cyclists, and in July 1997, Canadian Yvonne Melbash was biking along the mountainous road when she was suddenly forced off the road by a man driving a large truck. Yvonne later recounted that the man yelled obscene profanities at her as he exited his vehicle and tried to force her inside. Luckily, Yvonne managed to escape taking cover behind a tree. The man attempted to run her over, but eventually gave up and sped away. However, park rangers apprehended him as he tried to leave the park. The man was identified as Daryl David Rice. A search of Daryl's vehicle revealed zip ties in the glove compartment, likely intended for restraining victims. At the time of Yvonne's attack, Daryl was in his late 20s and living in Columbia, Maryland. Although he had no previous criminal record, Daryl had been fired from his job at Maryland's MCI System House in June 1997 for being highly volatile with co-workers and customers. Other employees reported that Daryl often threatened and cursed at them, and on one occasion, he punched a hole in the men's restroom wall after being caught stealing lunches from the break room. In 1998, Daryl pleaded guilty to attempted abduction and was sentenced to 135 months in federal prison. During interviews following his arrest, prosecutors began to suspect that Daryl might have been involved in the murders of Julia and Lila. This suspicion was based on the close proximity of the two incidents, Daryl's predatory behavior in his professional life, and his apparent preference for targeting female victims. Daryl was also caught on video entering Shenandoah National Park at Front Royal on May 25, 1996, and was seen again at Rockfish Gap on May 26, during Julia and Lila's camping trip. Daryl returned with friends on June 1, possibly intending to dispose of the bodies, but the presence of police seems to have deterred him. Daryl later denied being in the park in late May, but he admitted to being there on June 1 with friends. This contradicted publicly available security footage, exposing Daryl's lie. Despite the circumstantial evidence, it wasn't until five years after the murders that the state attorney general announced Daryl David Rice's indictment for the murders of Julia Williamson and Lila Wyman. In a 2001 press conference, prosecutors alleged that Daryl had expressed enjoyment in assaulting women, describing them as more vulnerable. Even more chillingly, Daryl allegedly admitted to the murders, claiming the women deserved to die because they were a lesbian couple. Daryl was ultimately charged with four counts of capital murder, two of which were classified as hate crimes, making him eligible for the death penalty if convicted. However, Daryl was never sentenced. Despite prosecutors spending years building a case against him, they lacked sufficient forensic evidence. In 2003, a single hair found at the crime scene was tested, and the results proved that Daryl David Rice couldn't have been the killer. With that revelation, the entire case fell apart. Although the FBI refuses to discuss potential suspects, the murder of Julia and Lila remains an open investigation. Around the 20th anniversary of their deaths, the FBI issued a press release and updated posters hoping that continued coverage of the case might bring in the crucial piece of information needed to bring someone to justice and provide peace for the families. If they were still alive today, Lila and Julia would be nearing 50, 
likely still enjoying their lives together and indulging in their shared love of the outdoors. While time has moved on, their memories are kept alive by their loved ones, the FBI, and the longtime staff at Shenandoah who were working in the park all those years ago. One former park ranger, who was a self-proclaimed amateur geologist, remembered how the news of the murders affected him. I felt bad knowing that they were out there having a good time, looking at rocks, and then something so terrible happened, he said. I was a young ranger at the time, and it really impacted my career. Before that, I didn't take the law enforcement side of my job as seriously as I do now. I was more focused on having fun out in the backcountry. But after that, everything changed. I started taking my job much more seriously. Over two decades have passed since Julia and Lila were murdered in Shenandoah National Park. The shock of their deaths is now a distant memory in an otherwise serene recreational area. But the next time you're hiking Old Rag or stargazing in the big meadows, consider the beauty of the landscape as well as its history. Though the views are breathtaking, they also hold the memories of those whose lives were tragically ended too soon. Perhaps the next time you lace up your boots and hit the trail, you'll feel a shiver of awareness, a reminder of the shadows that occasionally pass through even the most serene of places. The wilderness, while a sanctuary for many, can also be a place where humanity's darkest instincts come to light. Julie's and Lolly's untimely deaths serve as a sobering reminder that danger can sometimes lurk in the most unexpected corners. For those who knew them, the Shenandoah holds bittersweet memories of joy and sorrow intertwined. They speak of the women's kindness, their passion for nature, and their love for each other, a love that was silenced far too soon. In the years since their passing, the park has seen countless visitors many of whom walk the same trails, unaware of the heartbreak that once echoed through these woods. Yet, the memory of Julie and Lolly remains alive in the hearts of those who loved them, in the minds of the investigators who sought justice for them, and in the lingering questions that haunt this beautiful but haunted place. The case may remain unsolved, but their story endures, a poignant reminder to cherish every moment spent in nature's embrace to look out for one another, and to always be mindful of the world around us, both its beauty and its potential for darkness. As you gaze up at the stars from big meadows, or listen to the wind rustling through the trees on Old Rag, let the memory of Julie and Lolly guide you to not just appreciate the grandeur of the wild, but also to tread with caution, respect, and remembrance for those who came before. For now, the Shenandoah stands as a testament to nature's grandeur and the memories of those who found joy in its embrace. And while the mystery surrounding Julie and Lolly's deaths may never fully unravel, their spirits continue to roam the park, remembered by those who hike its trails, stargaze in its meadows, and seek solace in its quiet corners. I spent most of my life living in the Appalachian Mountains, always in fairly isolated areas that are usually peaceful and surrounded by forests. A few years ago, I was sitting on my porch around midnight, enjoying a beer and the calm of the night. If you've never lived out here during the summer, you might not know that nature isn't quiet at night. In fact, it can be incredibly loud. The cicadas are buzzing, frogs are croaking, and you might hear the occasional grunt or squeal from other animals. It's like nature's version of white noise, and it can be really soothing. But sometimes, nature throws things at you that are downright frightening. So, this one time, I'm out on the porch, drinking my beer, listening to that constant hum of the woods, when suddenly, everything went silent. It was like a wave of quietness washed over the forest until you could have heard a pin drop from a long distance away. Then, out of nowhere, I heard the most terrifying sound I've ever encountered, coming from about 20 to 30 feet in front of me. It was this incredibly loud, blood-chilling scream, unlike anything I had ever heard before. I knew it wasn't a bobcat. I've heard those before, 
and they usually stay far away from people. This sound had a strange, almost human quality to it, but I knew it wasn't a person. People just don't make sounds like that. Not when they're in their right mind, anyway. I got up, went inside, and sat by the window with my shotgun within arm's reach until I had enough beer in me to not be scared anymore. That was the only time I ever heard that sound, and I hope to God I never hear it again. Some folks have suggested it might have been an owl since they can make some pretty eerie screeching noises at night. But honestly, there's no way it was an owl. Those birds are tiny, and whatever I heard was way bigger than a bird. It didn't make repeated cries, either. Just one long, horrifying scream before I heard it moving away through the woods. And unless there's a rare type of owl around here that walks on four or two legs, I can safely say it wasn't a bird. I don't live in that area anymore, and I'm glad for it because whatever was out there that night, I'm happy to be far, far away from it.